And with in his preaching, he said, if any man will do, if any man will do. They should have known the doctrine. They were Jew Jews from Judaism. They knew the doctrine of the Jews, whether it be of God. So Jesus said, I'm not going to teach you doctrine. I'm going to teach you the practicality of Christian life. That's why I say, if you live the Serpent on the Mount, you will have a perfect life. He handles everything that, that tends to our lives. Everything. So Christ begins his teaching with, if any man will do. Later on in the Sermon on the Mount, he also says, if any man will teach, will break these commandments and teach them, and you should be the least in the kingdom of God. Then at the very end, he said, the, the, those that listen and do the, what I'm teaching will be like a man who built his house upon the rock. Can you say that? All right. So it's exciting. And uh, I, I've been tempted several times to go ahead and go to something else just to break uh, break up the Sermon on the Mount and go, because I want to teach you things of the Old Testament. Thing. But we need to study and continue to study the Sermon on the Mount and finish it out. Can you say amen? Amen. Right. We've been doing some pretty heavy stuff. That's why today I was going to lighten up, lighten the load a little bit. And uh, we're right into the end of the doctrine of divorce and remarriage. We read 1 Corinthians 7. We're into all kinds of stuff. Pretty heavy stuff. So, the circumstances of this sermon. Verses 1 and 2. Watch this. This is so beautiful. The circumstances of the sermon uh, are being accounted for. Verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, uh, when in, in seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain. Went up into a mountain. And then he was set on a stone in the mountain. Oh, I love the humanity of Christ. Don't you? The humanity. When, when Jesus looked around, he saw the five, ten thousand people out there. How did his voice carry? What did God do to so There was no amplification. There was no microphone. There was no... The, how did his voice carry, Brother Nick, to, to five or ten thousand people? And everyone heard him. They were quiet. He opened his mouth and talked and saying, Bless him. Well, Christ goes over there, he sits down, and he finds this azure blue sky and a green grass and a beautiful rock, and on the mountain, there's a reason for that. He doesn't try to go ahead with notions, but he guides your practical living. If you're going to be a Christian, be different. If you're going to be a Christian, do this. If you're going to be a Christian, do that. He proposes blessedness and gives us the character of those who are entitled to blessedness and he uses the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes of being, those things that teach us the attitudes of our life and they're also paradoxes. Think about this, Brother Greg. Blessed is a Blessed is the they who mourn. Okay? But they should be comfortable. Blessed are the poor. For they should be blessed and feeble. So there are paradoxes that Jesus starts out with at the very beginning of this sermon. And he talks to us about things that, that, that makes us think from the very beginning. And what Christ teaches here is very, very important because it's his very first sermon. The Old Testament, last word in the Old Testament is curse. In Matthew, from Malachi. The first word in his, out of his mouth is blessed. Jesus said, I'm coming to teach you something new. Not the curse of the Old Testament, but the blessings of the New Testament. So, he prescribes duty as the way we ought to live. And gives us standing rules of that duty. He pressures the disciples to understand what they are, who they are, and what they should do. He says to them, a couple more verses down, he said, You're the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. Two different entities. There's two different things. Two different elements. Salt of the earth, light of the world. He talks about being the light over all the 
world. He talks about souls on the area where you are. The reason we're souls is we go in, we don't, we don't stop the corruption of the, of, of the world, but we help to heal it. Can you say amen? amen. You're the salt, Vanessa. You go in your own area where you live and you act a certain, a certain way. People look at you and say, well, she must belong to God. They took notice they had been with Jesus. And every one of us, we have at least 14 people that we influence. Have you know that? Every person in life has at least 14 people that you influence. And Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. The element is salt. The entity is the earth. You are the light of the world. That's a bigger thing. And then Jesus said when he was going away, he said, be, be, be careful to, to preach in Jerusalem. And then in Judea. And then in Samaria. And then into the uttermost parts of the world. Jesus uses people right. to preach the message. He took these his disciples and the disciples were fighting with one another. Who should be the greatest in the kingdom of God? In fact, one of them, Brother Green, one of them said that Jude, Jude, John, the, the sons of thunder said, saw their mama and they said, hey mama, Jesus listens to you. Now listen up. Uh, go up there. And they, were, they were scared, sister, to ask Jesus himself because he didn't, didn't want to be come down. So they said, mama, can you go over and ask Jesus who will be the greatest? Can, in fact, can you ask them, Jesus, if we can be the, on the right hand and on the left hand of God? Not very egotistic, go <laughs> on. Ah. You know what Jesus did, Mickey? He did, did not upbraid them. He didn't upbraid Thomas for his lack of doubt. He did not upbraid the, the, the uh, Pharisees for giving their offerings so holy. They didn't, they didn't go against the scribes because they're standing in the marketplace. And do He doesn't upbraid. He simply said there's a better way. And, and, and on this answer, he said, it's not mine to give. It's not mine to give. Jesus said to be divorced. One school says this. One school says that. We'll get into the rest. Jesus said... Well, Moses did give you right. But he goes against the Moses. From these people, he goes over them, over Moses, and goes back to the beginning and said it wasn't so in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Isn't Jesus wonderful? Mm -hmm. And then I see Jesus sitting on a stone, sitting on a whale, asleep in the boat. Jesus was man, very man, and God, very God. Who can say amen to that? Amen. He is the only one. He's the eternal creator. He's the one that made the prophet of the Old Testament and the prophet of the New Testament. He's the one that writes us in the New Testament. He's the one that makes us stop up and down and say, we can be saved. We can be healed. Yes. We can be turned on the God. Yes. Jesus is that kind of person. Yes. Yes. I mean, the rest of the disciples. Hallelujah. Well, I tell you what, I can preach this stuff, but I'm not here to preach. Good to you. To understand what they have to do they are governed by a moral law. Jesus said often in his Sermon on the Mount, you have heard it had been said. And they knew all the things that had been said. The Pharisees had like 270 rules that you could not break on the Sabbath day. Jesus came and set them all free. He said, ah, don't worry about all that stuff. He said, Jesus, your disciples are eating corn. If they're hungry, they're going to eat dinner. You know what if a ditch, if a donkey's in a ditch, let him go on the Sabbath day, otherwise he will die. So Jesus came as a revolutionary. He was preaching something that, 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 that turned the people on. It wasn't like the law. And the fact that he got done preaching, he said, and he spoke as one having authority and not as a scribe to the person. You know why? Because Jesus was getting the mind of God, coming straight from the mind of God. And when he spoke, everybody could feel the anointing of the Holy Spirit when he preached. Can you say amen? amen. Pharisees and Sadducees, nah, they were just going over the old stuff. Jesus said, if you're going to understand what you have to do, there must be a moral law. So Christ wanted his disciples to be aware. Now watch me. Listen to me. Christ wanted his disciples to be aware of the Pharisees and the scribes. The Pharisees believed in resurrection, so they were fair, you see. The Sadducees did not, so they were sad, you see. Yes, you know. Ah. 
when the scribes and the Pharisees talked, they had the, the divers mistakes. They had sometimes willful mistakes. Sometimes they had gross corruptions. And Jesus comes to change that. Now watch this. The Pharisees talk about uh, the sixth commandment. Jesus talks about the sixth, the sixth commandment. Uh, in verses 21 and 26, he said, you can't kill. But he said, not only can you not kill, but if you hate your brother without a cause, moral law. If I hate you, Timmy, and I, don't, and I, just, I just don't like the way you work, move the church away. And you know there's some people in the world that they, they can like, dislike you for the smallest reasons. Uh, sister Bonnie, you, you, you remind me of my sister Bonnie that I have, and I love her to death, so I love her to death because she reminds me of my sister Bonnie. But somebody else might remind you of somebody that, that hates you, and if you have one person that hates you and ten people love you, what do you think about all the time? You don't want to hate you? Not just the wicked. She knows everybody love her, so she don't have anybody hate Ah. Jesus said, he preached the sixth commandment, the seventh commandment, the third commandment, the law of retaliation, uh, in verses 21 and 26, the sixth commandment, Jesus said, not only should you not kill, but stop hating each other. That's what I've said. Stop hating each other. On the seventh commandment, he said, you've heard it said that, that if you go to bed with a woman, you've committed adultery. But I say, if you look at a woman that lusts after her, you've committed adultery already in your hearts. The third, the seventh commandments. And then there's a third commandment, 37, 33, 37. He, he, that's, where, that's where we are right now in, in this particular area. He said, stop swearing. Don't swear. I'm going to tell you something about Paul. Paul the Apostle was so cool. Just the green Paul said, you that preach, thou shalt not lie. Do you lie? To preach it. He said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? He's talking to preachers. Paul said, You that preach this, do you do it? You that preach that, do you do that? Why? Because we're still in the flesh. We're still people. And we still need to hang on to the horn of the altar to keep the anointing flowing that we don't find ourselves in sin as the rest of the world. Can you say amen to this now? <clears throat> Then Jesus says this in verses 38 to 42. This is, this is going to touch a lot of your lives. It's the law of retaliation. You see, Christ is going over all this, these things they knew, but he's putting a different light on it. He said, in fact, Romans said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Amen. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. It is so easy, Sister Karen, for me to stand up when somebody comes against me and I want to go back against them. I have certain powers, getting less every day, but I have certain powers where I know I can knock somebody upside the head. But we're taught by, the, by Jesus not to do this, but to, but, but to, 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 to go back with no evil. They had a rule. The Romans had a rule. Jesus said, don't fight. If they come to you and want you to walk a mile, go with them two miles. And on the second mile, you can preach Jesus to them because they were, the Romans were supposed to go one mile. Go one mile, be quiet. The Romans do. Because the Jews were under their bondage, Jesus said, let's do it this way. Instead of walking one mile, let's go. He said, if you slap me in the face, turn to them the other. Now, this doesn't mean if somebody breaks in your house, Karen, and he's going to do you harm, get a gun, blow them away. As far as I'm concerned, that's me now, that's me. But Jesus said, under persecution, if they're coming against your faith, and they say, give me your coat, give me your coat also. Walk them out, walk them twain. Give me this, do that. Strike him on the cheek, turn to him the other cheek. 
under persecution to show that your faith is stronger than what they're going to do. But it doesn't teach passivity. It doesn't teach to lay down and let somebody come in your home and say, we talked about it, they were putting in the wires, didn't we? You bring them my home, I've got a 38, I've got a 10 pound chihuahua, and I've got a mean wife. I tell you what, if one of them don't get you, I'm going to blow you away. Tammy with her mom, and so I'm glad. Well, it's on that YouTube thing over there. All right. The scope of a hold is this. Jesus taught us that the law is real and the law is spiritual. The law is spiritual. A lot of people say they don't read the law. The law is a schoolhouse. Maybe you should give you this. I, I probably shouldn't. But uh, I'm going to help you out here. What was a, the tight end in the Old Testament? 10%. Alright? Abraham, the very first time we ever see it being done, when Abraham goes to go get that, and the preacher preached about it the other day, and he goes to go get it, and he gives it 10% of all his belongings. The New Testament doesn't talk about that. That's the Old Testament. That's the schoolhouse. Now, the New Testament says, bring your guys in the storehouse. But the New Testament says this. It's not how much you bring, it's the way in which you bring it. Amen. The New Testament, give joyfully, give openly, give unto the Lord. The Old Testament, bring 10%. The Old Testament says, if you make a vow to God, and you, you suppose we bring 10%, and this is not very well known, but if you fail to bring the 10%, then you have to bring 20%. Do you know that? Now we have a general account of the sermon. The preacher was Jesus Christ, the Prince of Persians, the great prophet of the church, the light of the world. Oh, there are so many different ways you can talk about Jesus. The manifestation of the glory of God, the Logos, the prepared word, the breathed word of God. Jesus was a breathed word. Closer to God than any living creature. The Son of God, created by God, no, He was born of God. The beautiful, beautiful verse 1, verse 2 in Genesis. And God, Elohim, the perfect Elohim. The Hebrew word is Elohim, what does that mean? Triple, plural. In the was a, was a, well, in the was a, Oh, he being God. Oh. Did you know the Bible does not try to prove God? Did you know that? The Bible assumes God. Can you say amen? The Bible assumes in the beginning God. And the word God is Elohim. It means three in one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's just like an egg. The egg has, has a shell and the whites and the yolk. Is the yolk the egg by itself? No. The white, no. The, no. It takes three of them to get egg. Three forms of water. Gas, steam, water, and ice. All water. God is so perfect. They are independent one of another. God creates. Jesus redeems. The Holy Spirit sanctifies. But yet they're three in one. God says, let us go down and make man in our own image. Three in one. The Elohim. God. And Jesus is that God. Jesus is a God in the flesh. But Christ excels all of them. Christ is the eternal wisdom of God. He lay in the bosom of the Father. He came from the bosom of the Father. Every time God, even when He came in the Garden of Gethsemane, as I preached Wednesday night, He was not a coward. He didn't say to God, I don't want to go to the cross. He said to God, if there's some way, don't let me become sin. I said, you will. Do. He comes in the bosom of the 
the Father. He knew the will of God perfectly. So therefore, in the end of his, in the end of his garden, he got sin experience. He said, God, it's not my will. It's the only time Jesus ever says this in the whole word of God. It's not my will, but yours. Perfect perfection. And he's teaching this sermon. He's teaching this sermon. He is the not only the eternal wisdom, but he is the eternal word. By whom he, I like Hebrews, brother Green, it says, by whom he has spoken of, a, by, by his prophets and his angels and times in the present time. We have heard from the prophets in the past. We have heard from great teachers in the past. But now Hebrews says, Jesus has come to make it known to us. I have a book called The Holiest of All by Andrew Murray. It's about that thick. What a, what a story. I preached the book of Hebrews in the past all the way through. You talk about stuff that make you stand up and shout, brother, sister. The book of Hebrews is so holy. And yet in the middle of it all, he said con 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 concerning the sermon not. The book of Hebrews says, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. Hmm. That's a strange verse to put in the holy, holy book of Hebrews. But it was so important that he says to the married folks, folks, be careful. Be careful. Don't use your, your, your abilities as punishments or as other things. The many miraculous cures wrought by Christ in Galilee. Do you realize that all the way through the first part of the book of Matthew, he's writing to the Jews as Jesus is the king of kings. And he takes that fourth chapter where Jesus is driven. It's the only place in the word of God that says this. And he was driven by the Holy Ghost. How do you know Jesus followed the Holy Ghost? And he was filled with the Holy Ghost without major. Jesus was able to do everything just in Vanessa because he had the Holy Ghost. But he was a man, very man, therefore he needed the power of the Holy Ghost to do his miracles. He was like us. But he walks out, and Bible says he was driven by the Spirit. And he goes away from all the other people, the Pharisees have all kinds of crowds. Everybody, but Jesus goes by himself into the wilderness. After he was baptized. Because this is now going to be the one time that he faces the enemy with eternal consequences. And the enemy's out there, and Jesus is out there for 40 days and 40 nights. There's no water, no food. He's being supported by God himself. At the end of this 40 days and 40 nights, Satan comes out like a little red man, real red, 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 says, he says, God. Break the law of God. Is that what he said? No. He comes and said, Jesus, uh, your fast is over, right? <coughs> then 48. Yeah. Uh, Jesus, you have creative power, right? Of course, you know I do. Satan. Uh, go ahead and make these, turn these stones into bread. Could he do that, Sister Monica? Could he turn the stones into bread? Do you know the place in the scripture where it says he did? But the disciples came back from fishing and they found Jesus after his resurrection on the beach. And he had made bread, fish, and fire. And he had no Walmart, no 7 Eleven, no. So he made those things. And I believe he turned to Satan and said, Now, say, Satan, I can do this when I want to. But during the temptation, he said, I, I can't do that. Man shall not live that alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And brother says that he can do what he wants to. I was talking to seeing uh, one of the bosses, boss, bosses, boss, boss, who goes to world, the world outreach. I didn't know that. And he listens to Smyrna Church of God. And he, uh, he was talking about some of the stuff we were talking about. And uh, I tell you what, these people are great when you find the relationship with the folks, right? But we're talking about different things. And the Lord comes about this blue on. So, uh, we are intended to make ways. We are intended to make ways in the sermon. Let me get to this real quick. When he's out there with Satan, 
Satan goes against his body. He goes against his ministry. He goes against his will. He goes against... He does everything. He goes against his pride. When Satan says, make this stone into bread, Jesus said, I'll not do it. And then he gives a verse, and Satan takes him up. And that's another thing. The only place I see Satan doing anything with Jesus is in, a, is in a temptation. But he's driven by the Holy Spirit, and Satan takes him anywhere. Take him. He took him to the pinnacle of him. And he said, cast yourself down, pride of man. The lust of flesh, the pride of life, and the pride of life. John, for first John talks about those temptations. He takes them up there and says, catch yourself while these superstitious people will worship you. And then Satan goes the verse. He'll give his angels charge over you. Let's read that should go against the snow. Psalm 91. But Jesus saw it again. He was alone. He was hungry. He was thirsty. Probably sleeping. But he's out there all by himself with the enemy. And after all this, he comes and preaches this phenomenal sermon on the mountaintop. And I'll get to it. Can't do it, Satan. I'm not going to cast myself down. Of course I know these people that believe. They're, they're superstitious. Ha ah. ha! And then he takes them to mountains and said, I will show you all the kingdoms of the world. You know why he was able to. That's his privilege, and that's his where he lives. Can you say amen? Lord, look at all the kingdoms of the world. He saw Rome and Greece and Persia and Neo Persia and Iraq and Iran and the United States. He saw all the world and said, If you bow down and worship me, Jesus said, That's what I thought. Ah. That's what it's all about. The Son of God worshiping Satan. Oh, okay. What's wrong with this picture? Everybody say everything. everything. And he turned to Satan and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Right on. Leave me now. And the word of God, John said, The angels came and ministered. Michael, Gabriel, they were there when Jesus was born. They were there at the resurrection. They were there at the tomb. And I believe, Sister Barney, it was Michael and Gabriel. It was there that he came to minister to Jesus after he defeated the enemy. And then he comes, and the word of God says he walked up into a mountain. I mean, he was set. His disciples came up. All those lovers. You can tell you something, the Pharisees had the, the palaces, the Pharisees had the, had the synagogues, the Pharisees had the chairs, the Pharisees had all the comfort in the world. Jesus was given a mount. Don't you ever be afraid and be ashamed when God gives you less than He gives big shot because your less will be more than their big shot. Jesus went against the Pharisees and the scribes and Pharisees. He went against them and said, yeah, you, they corrupted the law. Jesus walks up into a mountain and when he was set, oh, oh, he opened his mouth and teaches them to say, oh, and we're going to skip this? No. Oh, the sermon is a summary or a rehearsal of what Jesus preached up and down the coast of Samaria. We're intended to make a way for this sermon and whom there appeared much of a divine power and goodness and he it's the things that Jesus preached. I've got to shut up and sit down, so once again, let me give you real quick. His place was a mountain in Galilee. There was no convenient place to preach. Jesus said to the young man who wanted to follow him, Lord, I'll follow you, I'm a rich man, I'll follow you. Jesus said, Foxes have told. Birds of the air have nests. I have no way. Do they have The Besides the Creator, I have no way. You know what he said? I have no way.
Jesus said to Peter, Will you leave me too? Peter said, Lord, you might go. So where did he preach? The place was a mountain in Galilee. Let me tell you something, Brother Green. It wasn't even a famous mountain. It wasn't Sinai. Where the wall came from it. It, it wasn't where Moses died on Mount Nebo. It was simply a mountain. So what does he do? He opens his mouth and he teaches them life. Lord Jesus, a great teacher of truth, is driven out to the desert, finds no better place for a pulpit than the mountain can afford. And not one of the holy mountains is here, but Christ is still teaching today's gospel. And you know what I believe I've done that, Brother Green, when he did not have a place for a pulpit? I believe Jesus is bringing it down to this. You can preach the gospel anyway. In the VA, at your work, at your place, at your place. You do need a church to find people in order to preach. You can preach it in That's the liberty 